My name is Father Mark Thamert. I work with Jake Hardy in the Benedictine Institute. I just wanted to uh, update you on a couple of things we're doing in the Benedictine Institute. Uh, for students, we are creating a Benedictine living floor at the a top floor of Virgil Michael. Uh, it'll be between 12 and 22 students, um, current freshmen who will become sophomores, and they'll spend their entire year living together, um, having a whole series of talks and book discussions and all sorts of things, along with a, with a course that will go along with it, and we're very excited about that. We're also going to be conducting workshops for faculty uh, to get kind of Benedictine content spread throughout the whole curriculum. For example, Roger Narlock is teaching a course on happiness. He would simply do a big chunk on Benedictine ways to a fulfilled life. Um, so those are two wonderful initiatives. As you know, uh, the applications for the study tours this summer are due on the last Monday of October. So get yours in. Um, you can send those to me. Uh, just simply read uh, Gloria Hardy's, Chick Hardy's uh, um, invitation to apply, and you can talk to many people who have already been on it. It's one of the most profound, probably the most profound traveling, travel experience I've ever had in my life. I did it this past summer uh, for 12 days. I've been, I've been to Europe a lot, but nothing comes close to this experience with that group over there. You can imagine, you can imagine. Okay, um, David Paul is giving his uh, talk today. I'll let Chick uh, introduce him. Uh, the next talk on our series, November 18th, will be done by Father Columbus Stewart, From the Dark Ages to the Cold War Europe from Ethiopia to the Middle East and India, and on to Timbuktu. How Benedictines can't stop preserving endangered manuscripts. It should be a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation by him. We have afternoon events now. It's called, instead of lunch and learn, it's called tea and talk. And, and our, our first one is gonna be Annette Atkins with her new book on the uh, Sisters of uh, St. Benedict. Um, Challenging Women Since 1913. Uh, that one's filled up, by the way, um, but there are going to be uh, at least two, three more. One is going to be on Pope Francis's recent statement. Just a discussion group to get together. Uh, we'll send out the statement to you. Um, you can choose what, what you want to comment on. It'll be simply a discussion about the future of the Catholic Church and maybe how Benedictines relate to that future. Um, uh, in March, we will have the Feast of St. Benedict. We have a speaker, Gerald Schlabach, from the University of St. Thomas, and he'll be talking about a monastic topic. He's, uh, he's head of the Mennonite Dialogue between Catholics and Mennonites, and he is also an oblate of St. John's Abbey as, as, a, um, as a Benedictine oblate. We have also a, a series of speakers starting one each semester for five semesters on the documents of the Vatican Council on the, on the exact 50 year date when, they, when each of them came out. And we have some wonderful speakers for that. And uh, I told them I wouldn't disclose the names of the speakers yet, but I'm gonna ask Chick Hardy to introduce our, our speaker. Let's give Chick a hand for everything that she does for us. I just told him to go sit down. <laughs> um, okay. Our speaker today, Brother David Paul Lang, he, he joined the monastery in 1986, and for those of you who are doing the math, it's 27 years. So, um, one note of distinction is that he is the first son of a faculty member to join the monastery. And your father taught what? Did math. He, math. He did teach math. Okay. For 40 so. years. Ooh. Which I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's currently a member of the art department. He teaches sculpture and art history and drawing and design. 
and he loves to sing. If you've ever heard him sing, you'll think you've been transported to heaven. He has a lovely voice. Um, not only does he teach sculpture, but he does sculpture. You've noticed the new statue out between the quad and the music building. And that, of course, is a, a young version of Benedict. And um, this summer I was, I was outside. Of course, we have lots of visitors in the summertime. And, and there was a family with, with a little girl. I'm guessing she was about four or five. And she was pulling on her, her mom's uh, purse. And she said, let's go see the guy with the bird. Let's go see the guy with the bird. <laughs> and, and of course, she didn't know what that meant. And so later I did see them over by Benedict and the raven. And I think she was more interested in the bird than she was in the guy. But, <laughs> but whenever I walk by there now, oh, there's the guy with the bird. Um, David Paul was also pretty involved with the stick house that was built last year as you're driving into campus on the left-hand side, can hardly miss it. Um, so he has his touches kind of all over campus. Um, he was also appointed sub-prior recently. Um, and for those of you who don't know the hierarchy, it's the abbot, it's the prior, and it's the sub-prior. Kind of like the president, the vice president, speaker of the house. So. This is no schmaltzy event we have here, we have. <laughs> um, but along with, with that uh, new uh, job, he has, he has greater responsibilities, and I'm sure his time management skills have been honed to a fine fervor. No, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> but which I'm even more grateful that he would take time for us today. So if you would please join me in giving him a warm welcome, Brother David Paul. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It pains me to close the blinds and turn off some lights on such a nice day, but I think it'll be worth it. That's not a great bulb, so the color resolution is not so great on what I'm about to show you, but it's about the images. So uh, what I'm going to do here might not be possible. I'm going to try to condense what is usually about 140 minutes worth of content into 40. Um, so my intention is to whet your appetite, to get you interested. And if you want to know more, there's more. And uh, come and take a class. Talk to Father Hillary, because I'd like to make a plug right away for Father Hillary's book. Put it in the light here. Um, Marcel Breuer and a committee of 12 plan a church. Father Hillary is the sole remaining living member of the committee, the Abbey Committee, um, that helped Marcel Breuer build the church. So um, he's our living link to. <laughs> and what you were watching while we were eating is some footage that most of us in the room have not even seen. It's footage from the dedication day of the new Abbey Church. It's from actual film footage that Victoria Young, one of the professors at the University of St. Thomas, um, came across in her research on the Abbey Church for a book that is much anticipated and about to come out soon, which I think we all will want to read. Um, it's wonderful footage that she had converted to a DVD, which I think David Klingeman, the Abbey Archivist, got in the mail yesterday and distributed immediately to some people who were interested. So I was watching it for the first time as well. I love the clothing. How was that? <laughs> the, way, the way that ended was awesome. So OK, today, uh, my intention is to talk about how we went from that to this. And not to repeat anything that Hillary or anyone else perhaps has presented in a much more articulate way, I'm going to give you some visual backstory and give you some visual context for this. This is a topic I'll talk about in my sculpture classes. I'll talk about it in the modern contemporary art history class because it directly relates to the development of modernism in the middle, well, throughout the 20th century and into the, our time now. But it's, it's, a, it's a topic that is near and dear to my heart and that touches everyone's lives who lives and works and studies here. Whether we like that structure or not, personally, I say it's not the, it doesn't matter to me. 
This is what I tell my students. I don't care if you love it or hate it. I just want you to understand a little bit about how it came to be. And invariably, once people know something about something, they, they hate it a little less, you know? <laughs> and and that, that's not so bad. So uh, it's how we got to this. This is uh, the model for the, the Breuer Church. How we got there from where we were, that is such an interesting story. A little back story here. Here's the Abbey Church under construction way back in 1874. Um, the monks wanted to build a bigger church, but couldn't afford to. So they, they built what they thought would be adequate for the vision that they had for the community. Um, by the time the 1950s come around, it's woefully undersized, but they did the best they could back in the 19th century. Here it is from Prep School Point, together with uh, the old stone house, which is still here. Um, this is replaced by another house now, which is the crew house, the boat house. Here's a view from coming down the prep school hill. Off to our right would be the new science center, which isn't there, of course, yet. Shows you just how agrarian the community is. Still the stone house where they started. And then finally, over across the lake, looking back, isn't it amazing how many trees are not there yet? <laughs> <laughs> and how self-contained it is. And St. John's was known as the place with the Twin Towers, long before there was a, there a pair in Manhattan. Um, very iconic image. It appears on the china that everyone's eating off of in this time period. The two towers, the two very tall spires that uh, are not there anymore. Their, their bases are there um, on top of the Great Hall, but the towers themselves aren't. Knowing that the monks came from southern Germany is helpful. If you've been on the Benedictine Heritage Tour, you know that in southern Germany there are two communities, which is where the monks and the nuns, St. John St. Ben's, came from. They're not exactly four miles apart, but they are both within driving distance. Um, what was startling to me was that neither one was a wealthy monastery, even back then. What impressed me deeply was that both of them gave up essentially a fifth of their members to go to the New World without expecting they would ever come back. This after Boniface Wimmer approached all the other larger houses with far more members and all of them said no. That Eichstätt and Metten would say yes, even though they couldn't really afford to lose people, they weren't big monasteries, they took a risk. And that risk-taking, that courage in the face of great uncertainty, I'm convinced it has something to do with how both communities one day would become the largest communities for men and women in the world for Benedictines. So that can-do spirit, if I can borrow that phrase, that was there from the beginning in the face of great odds. So if, sidebar, we doubt what we can do in this day and age, Let's doubt less, because they managed to do amazing things with very little. This is what the church looked like at Metten for the monks that left and came here. I'll say more about it later, but I thought, what, what I'm looking at, I thought is, wow, those are, that's, that's pretty nice marble. That's, that's pretty expensive stuff. Huh, they must have been a wealthy, all the pictures led me to believe that they were a wealthy community until I got to go visit in person. Here's my own photo of the, a little closer to the sanctuary. Notice the, the abundance of natural light. There's not a single artificial light on in this space right now. It's, by the way, full of windows that have hexagons in them. Only throughout Europe, they're about that big as opposed to the American Breuer version, where they're five feet tall. And here's our own church in 1888. Whitewashed, a nice wooden altar, high altar up in the apse, but not a whole lot else. By 1900, they've been busy. <laughs> By 1911, even more. I wish this was in color. I would love to see what is happening, I mean, I can, I can see all sorts of evidence of gold leaf 
adorning all sorts of elements in the architecture, but there's basically not a surface that is not now covered with some design or picture or image or sculpture. By 1933, our bro brother Clement Frischhoff had been over to uh, the monastery of uh, Boiron, thank you, uh, to learn this style called Boironese art, which I won't go into now, but suffice it to say, it's a fascinating story, this new style of art that a monk there by the name of Desiderius came up with, literally, because he wanted an art form that would seem to go with the music that they were using and singing every day, Gregorian chant, which if you've heard some, you know it's not polyphonic. It doesn't have harmony. It's a beautiful single sung line. And why would the artwork, Desiderius thought, be so romantic and full of Sturm und Drang when the music we're singing is much more simple and stately and refined? So he comes up with an art form that marries Byzantine art with neoclassicism, with Egyptian art. It's fascinating. And what remains today is the apse of Christ the Good Shepherd. If we had time, we'd look at the archives and see the other images of Christ the King that apparently he did cartoons for as well. And uh, somebody must have decided, no, let's go with Christ the Good Shepherd as opposed to the man with the crown, the sash, the royal reference. Let's go with the Good Shepherd. Perhaps the abbot decided. And if I put the two images side by side in black and white to keep them fair, um, you can see that the styles themselves are different, but the inclination to fill the spaces, to adorn them with imagery and ornamentation that befits a place of worship of God, you can see that they're similar. They, they don't, they're not going for less is more here. They're going for more is more. <laughs> Let's fast forward to 1953. You all know a little bit of your American history, right? So you know that after World War II, things have changed radically in higher education, as well as monasteries and other walks of life. The university is burgeoning at the seams. Literally, there's not enough place for everybody to come together to pray. The nave in the Great Hall could only hold 350, and the choir stalls, far less. So the community couldn't literally pray together in one space at one time in 1953. And they needed space for basically everything. Abbot Baldwin writes the most amazing letter, dated March 7th, 1953, in which even his first two sentences are telling. Dear sir, I'm writing to you to ask whether you'd be interested in preparing a comprehensive building plan, a report for St. John's Abbey. We must build in the near future, and we believe that we shouldn't begin any construction until the plan has been prepared that will provide for our long-range needs so that all of our buildings will form a complete and unified whole. He's borrowing language right from modernism, by the way. Uh, he knows what he's saying, and it's an astounding sentence. Mind you, that's not what we got. Our buildings don't form aesthetically, much less stylistically, a unified, complete whole. We have instead a postmodern, sort of eclectic mix of things, and that's good. That's very good. But the intention, right off the bat, was to design for long-range needs on this plot of land so that all of the buildings were going to somehow form a complete and unified whole. He says, if we are a new institution, easy. If this plot were empty and we were to start from scratch, no problem. However, we're three years away from celebrating our centenary anniversary of our founding. So we have buildings already here. This, to any designer, is a challenge. How do you work with existing structures and forms and somehow add to them with perhaps a brand new aesthetic, something that isn't there yet? with materials that aren't there yet? How do you do that is no easy task. It's a challenge for any designer, but a good one will love it. Huh? Give me limitations. Give me challenges. Let's see if we can work with what your need is to provide for it better. The letter goes on. He describes who we are, 
college, prep school, seminary, uh, foundations of the Bahamas, Japan, and so on and so forth. And then he comes to the most interesting part of the whole thing. Before I get to it, though, I think I have included a few of the names of people that he wrote to. Walter Gropius, Belushi, Saarinen. Here's some examples. Gropius, who was one of the founding members of the Bauhaus School, which I'll introduce you to in a moment, um, is a very, very well-known architect. Belushi did the Juilliard School, ultimately in Manhattan. Sarnin, you're probably familiar with, did the Arch in St. Louis and the JFK Terminal. Beautiful, elegant, sloping roof line. Amazing, just beautifully simple forms. Neutra was mostly known for his houses, as was, by the way, Breuer at this time. Murphy, very, very simple interiors for worship spaces. Um, Murphy had actually designed some churches already. Breuer, mm mm. And then our man of the hour. Marcel Breuer himself, who was far more known for his residential properties as well as some larger communal structures, but more for residential. And he was Hungarian with Jewish ancestry. Very curious, very interesting. The letter. He identifies the needs. He says, after all, sitting all of these, we think the church is what we want to go for first. We think that's the most important thing that we need to design as a place for us to come together as a whole community to pray and worship. Although this present proposal, he says, concerns the comprehensive plan, we're most interested in building that church, which will be truly an architectural monument in the service of God. He's not aiming low here. He's aiming for the sky. Sheer overcrowding is forcing us to expand our facilities, and we don't want the mere material exigencies of the situation to determine our architecture. Meaning, if I break that apart, just because we need a church that'll seat 2,000 people, we don't want to throw up a gymnasium, something that looks like crap, but seats 2,000 people. <laughs> so we want to be mindful of the form of the thing. We don't want just the function to dictate everything. And then it gets really interesting, and you've probably heard the next sentence before. The Benedictine tradition, he says, at its best, challenges us to think boldly, to cast our ideals in forms which will be valid for centuries to come, shaping them with all the genius of present-day materials and techniques. It's an astounding sentence, an astounding one for an abbot to say to an architect, Think boldly, think long term, because Benedictines do. We're not, at our best, we shouldn't just think about our present situation, but be optimistic and hopeful and think of the future. Plan for what we, as best we can, think might the, the needs might be 100 years from now. That's audacious, but the Benedictine tradition challenges us to do that. Let's not just put blinders on and only address the needs of the moment. And then, shaping them with all the genius of present-day materials and techniques. We are not Amish, uh, and I mean that in no, no derogatory way, but Benedictines have never been suspicious of technology, have always embraced it. If it could make farming easier, then let's use this new tool, this new machine. Let's use it if it can make the life of the community better. I think that's significant. Benedictines will embrace new technologies when they're at their best to serve the community's needs both now and towards the future. We think, oh sorry, then he says what for me at least as a designer and in my art classes is an even more interesting sentence. We feel that the modern architect with an orientation towards two things, functionalism, which is not so hard to wrap our minds around, and I'll show you some examples, and then this honest use of materials is uniquely qualified to produce a Catholic work. Notice he doesn't say you need to be Catholic. <coughs> Thank you. If you can do the job, if you can listen to our needs and design it, we don't really care. The need is what's paramount here. So functionalism has to be one of the two important characteristics of this architect, an orientation towards that. But then this honest use of materials is uniquely qualified to do this for us. 
So I always ask my students, let's talk about that and talk to me about that. First of all, if we were to use a few monikers for, for modernism, they, you've heard them before, form follows function or function dictates form, talks about that intimate relationship between form and function. Neither should be more important than the other. In modernism, in the philosophy of the time, it is a desire to try to unite the form with what it does. And to not give too much to the form, and certainly not to undermine the form, so that it can meet the function, but not more than that, not go overboard. Can we live within our means from a design standpoint? is perhaps another way to phrase it. Can we live within our means? Can we, can we design our lives to fit the function of them and let go of things that aren't so necessary to the function? One of the first truly modern houses, note the date if you can see it, uh, Corbusier, Villa Savoy, outside of Paris, recognizes one of the first truly structure, modern structures for a dwelling for all sorts of reasons. It's geometry, it's pure white color, um, the, the use of materials like glass and concrete, the all-encompassing built-in furniture and furniture designed by the guy who also built the house and designed the house. By the way, the, the garage was under the house and the turning radius supposedly was perfect for a 1928 Citroen where you could drive around and then the garage was what you park in at an angle. It had three very curious ways of going from one floor to the next that didn't involve traditional stairs. And then it had this very curious rooftop garden. Again, all white with a window that framed the landscape beyond but didn't have glass in it and there's no roof over it. Very curious. It got everyone's attention in the architecture world. A quote from him. We don't, and we don't want any more of that stuff. All the stuff, by the way, which for centuries designers love to add. It's like, you know, if you're a cake designer and you're doing wedding cakes, don't you live for adding all the, you know, flowers and leaves and ornamentation? Isn't that the fun part? We don't want that. All the crenellation, all the sculptural additions, it isn't necessary, really, to the function of the building. Can we do without them? A few more examples. Mies van der Rohe did the Farnsworth House. Notice it's even raised off the ground. Flat roof, floor to ceiling, wall to wall glass panels. Here's the entrance to that house. Uh, he also did the Seagram building in New York, the first skyscraper of its kind. Doesn't look odd to us now. We, all, we take this form for granted that it's steel and glass, nothing at the top, nothing at the bottom, nothing by way of extra ornament. This looks like so many buildings now, but can you look at it in context and see how startling that is for its time? Not least of which is the fact that he left the front part of the square footage empty. This is some of the priciest real estate on the planet, and he leaves it empty? His philosophy, you know, making it really short and simple, this void, this negative space, was as, as important to the experience of the building as the building itself. That you would one day, when it, as the rest of this grew into a canyon, be able to come into this open square and breathe free before going into a building. That sense of openness was as important to him as the physical space that it took up, which is an interesting idea in itself. But you can see these are contiguous buildings built near in time. Um, even the Chrysler building, which I don't have time to go into, but that's fascinating, the story of how that spire got up there, the reticulation. OK, I'll tell it really quick. You know that uh, <laughs> architects love to have the tallest building. And that designer. Um, crunched the reticulation inside and didn't let on that one day, very near the end of its completion, because there was another bank building going up down the street taller than this one, until a week before finishing, <laughs> it became the tallest building. Sorry. Anyway. It rests on a bed of lights, beautiful. And Philip Johnson lived in an actual glass house in which you shouldn't throw stones, but which shows you everything it's made of. 
bricks, steel girders, clear glass. It's showing you everything and even how it's put together. Quintessential modernism. Sorry, I guess Neutre also here's an example. This is interesting, don't have time to go into it, but the fact that you could take away the corner of the building, cornerstones, along throughout architecture history, cornerstone's the most important piece because it's, it's the point off of which you measure all, everything else, and the corners usually had to be solid because you wanted your walls to stay perpendicular to, to each other and not collapse in or out. So the, the fact that now you could join corners with glass and effectively erase the corner, it's like a paradigm shift in architecture. But back to the question, what's this honest use of material all about? And rather than doing Q&A, which I would do, and it would take a while to try to flesh out what people are thinking, I'm going to fast forward. Um, let's just look at these two elements. There's no question that that's a steel girder. But what's this? What is that? What is that made of? If you think marble, the artist who trompe l'oeil painted that would say, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad, you know. <laughs> you know there's not a marble quarry for thousands of miles from here. You've got to go down to Tennessee or out to Vermont or something. There's no marble quarry here. But back home, a church had marble pillars in it. And if you can't afford it, then you do what everybody does. You improvise. And you make it look like something that's not so that you can make it look better. You ca I can't fault them. I think it's phenomenal. I absolutely admire that, that ability and that inclination. And I discovered back here at Metten, that in fact, when you look a little closer and you just poke around and it's like, you don't pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, you see that that's actually crumbling plaster. They've painted 90% of the stone in their church as well. So the monks that came here came from a tradition of make and do, of improvising, of being creative, to make it look better than it is so as to give glory to God. Now that works if you think that the only way to give glory to God is to use marble or something expensive. But if your philosophy changes and you can see the inherent beauty in very ordinary materials like clay, like ceramic, like concrete, then you have more options. And then suddenly you don't have to pretend. You don't have to make it look like something that's not, make it look better, but in fact you can use materials and not only use them for what they are, but even show you how they're made. You can reveal the process of the making. Quintessential modernism. Last but not least, anybody be bold? What, what architecture style do you think that is? What would you name it? What would you call it? If you were thinking Romanesque, ding, ding, you get the prize. But look at the dates for Romanesque. Huh. Here we are in 1955. Really? Do we have to use a style that's a thousand years old? Can't we try something new? With genius of present day materials and techniques? If I use a timeline and just show you, but the Roman, Romanesque revival goes all the way back to Romanesque, which goes all the way back to the Romans. It, it got its name because it was mimicking a Roman style. You could arguably say Romanesque, the Great Hall, is actually designed in a style 2,000 years old. So a modern architect, to make a long story short, would probably propose that we try something a little more of our time, a little more of our place, especially if you want me to think boldly. Then let's design something brand new. We're here on this timeline, 1955. Look at all the movements that have happened since then. Surely we can come up with something of our own time and place. A few more samples. I would point out, if I had time, some of the similarities in with Maria Locke, just the, the architectural elements that appear in our own great hall that appear in their church. But to even throw in another quick aside, uh, if this is the floor plan, the traditional T form, you've all seen it before, um, it no longer follows that, the Abbey Church, right? And if I make the story of architecture itself even more simple, um, you could say that architecture is all about designing a space so that it's protected from the elements. What you do in it, that can vary. How you do that, that can vary. But its essential purpose is to somehow protect a space, to define a space so that certain things can happen in it. Back in the Romanesque period, they had to really buttress the thick walls, usually below ground. You don't see this stuff usually. But buttress them so the walls don't collapse out with the weight. Darn it, the weight of that ceiling. That's always the big problem. How do you hold the ceiling up? so that it doesn't collapse. How do you do that and then span a big area? 
in the Gothic period, some genius loved to know who it is. But somebody figured out, you know, thinking like a physicist, what if we transfer the weight further away to the really thick wall that can withstand the pressure, but pu push it away so that we can shrink those internal walls? Boy, if you can shrink them, do you know what happens then? You can all of a sudden fill them with light and color, and they don't have to be thick and heavy with small openings. The Gothic period is when stained glass just flourishes. It's astounding how that happens. So long story short, a modernist would say what's arguably dishonest about this is that it doesn't use materials and construction techniques that are of its time. It doesn't let them be what they are. And can we do something else? The answer is yes. Bauhaus, 1919. Suffice it to say, a new school crops up after World War I in Germany that has a whole different philosophy about teaching architects. To make that wonderful long story short, their idea is that an architect should first learn how to work with all sorts of materials before designing a building. You should ideally know how to design your own furniture, how to design your own textiles, your own typography, so that your building one day could form a complete and unified whole. You designed all of what went into it, rather than delegating, you know, so often is the case in a firm. You've got to delegate because you've got to keep the projects rolling. So, you know, you have a team that does lighting, you have a team that does typography and so forth. No, the Bauhaus school thought the better way is to treat all the arts as equals. Nothing, nothing is dishonorable about being uh, a furniture designer. In fact, Marcel Breuer ultimately becomes the head of the wood job, the furniture design guy. He uses bent steel tubes and he does amazing things. And there's a reason, therefore, by the way, that the Abbey Church, with all of its oak, is not splitting, cracking, warping, or doing anything that you don't want wood to do. He understood the principles of wood and what it can do for you and designed accordingly. So their school is amazing. You had all sorts of time spent in various wood shops or shops in general um, after studying building techniques and all this sort of thing. And only then, for the last two years of the five and a half year program, did you start designing buildings. That's, that's the world out of which Marcel Breuer comes. Design it all. Design it so that it forms a complete and unified whole. If we were in his furniture design class, he'd say, so what's the essence of a chair? You sit on, you're sitting on one right now. What is the, what makes a chair a chair? Not a bench, not a stool, not anything else. Well, it has a back, it has a seat for one, and then it's stable. That seat is at a certain height, by the way, usually 17 to 19 inches maximum, somewhere in there, um, so that it's stable. Does it need four legs to be stable, though? If you're thinking outside the box, and you're thinking like a modernist who says, how can we meet the function with a form that doesn't dominate more than it has to? Does it need four legs? Could we maybe do three? Well, no. Thank you, though, James Croke. That's too tippy. That's a nice sculpture. That's considered a sculpture because it's not functional. Breuer says, I think I can do it with two. How about a chair with two legs? And arguably one, if you didn't pay attention to the scene there. One leg. How about one bent steel tube leg? How about that? Oh, my gosh. Strip away things that aren't important to the essence of the form. And in a nutshell, he designs all sorts of furniture in the same vein, as do all of the other modernist architects and designers. The Vasily chair, named after Vasily Kandinsky, here it is at a gallery, Museum of Modern Art in New York City, among paintings, except for the Andy Warhol and back, by painters who are asking the very same question. What's the essence of a painting at the end of the day? Does it really have to tell a story? Is it just rather pigment on a surface? Can we strip painting down to its essence? So are you getting the idea that the, the, the mind frame that all of this comes out of is a desire to get to the essence, to the core? And can you also hear how that might be interesting to monks who are trying to do the same thing effectively spiritually? Can we trim our lives down so that we are living within our means, that we don't acquire everything we want, but in fact use what we need, and so on and so forth. That this style of design in the middle of the 20th century was immediately appealing to monks for what it was doing from a design standpoint and how that resonates with 
what we're trying to do in our living tradition of monastic life, which is living in the moment. Okay, I know we have a 1500 year tradition, but it's dead if it's not alive now. How do we live in the moment and how do we live our lives simply, pared down, with dignity but without all the extras, all the poofs of gold and so on and so forth, to borrow Courbet's language. It's, by the way, the interior of the glass house by Philip Johnson. The furniture was meant to go with the building. That's quintessential modernism. By the way, leave out postmodernism, which loved now to mix things. You might have a Louis XIV armoire with a, you know, a shaker chair in a modernist. You, know, you can mix it up in this era. But in the middle of the 20th century, it was a desire to try to be purist about that. Can we really get at the essence and let go of everything else? Here he is as a young man. Here he is near completion of the Abbey Church. Here he is presenting his designs to Abbot Baldwin and the community. He did that often. Uh, this wonderful book by Hillary will, uh, this is fantastic. If you have a day on long weekend, you could devour this in a day. It's a page turner. It's fascinating. Um, but the dialoguing never ended. It was one of the reasons, by the way, they chose Marcel Breuer, if I'm, rem if I'm quoting this correctly, Hillary, because he was such a good listener, among many other things. But he was a good listener. If he came up with an idea and then presented it, and then the monk said, yeah, but what, um, what about this? What, what, have you thought about that? What could you? He didn't hesitate, effectively, to go back and try to do better, to change it, to meet the function. The only way to arrive at that form-function combination was to listen carefully to the function, especially if you're not a monk. So you've got to listen to what they were doing. Back to that aerial view. He gave him a master plan, by the way. Here's the model for it. Imagine everything like Tommy Hall, everything in poured concrete. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I like Tommy Hall, some aspects of it. I love the wall-to-wall -wall windows. The light in that building is crazy good. But I'm not so keen about a whole campus that looked that way. He thought very carefully about zones of function and everything like that. He designed, as you know, the library with its two trees of knowledge and wisdom. Another innovative way to hold that heavy roof up. It's always about how do you hold the roof up. In the Abbey Church, he uses the folding technique, which is phenomenal. It's genius to hold up all the weight like that without a single column. The runner down at the four-way stop, the athlete. <laughs> Have you seen that? Did you know that? He went through many models of the original facade of the church, and I'm glad it didn't stop there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little clunky. That's a little... Mm. Eventually, the honeycomb pattern comes in, only on a far larger scale and more dramatic shape than it would exist in any other window over in Europe. Amazing, just amazing. A great symbol, too. Just beehive, you know, worker bees, everybody working together. It's a great symbol with such rich uh, connotation. I'm, I'm going to go rather quickly because I want to at least show you a couple more things. They started with the monastery wing, by the way. And if I flash this up, you can see the association with the Farnsworth house, right? White, geometric flat. But it's this thing that I just want to pause on. The floor plan of the Abbey Church is, just, is an astounding thing, if you think about it. There is not a single column which prevents anyone from seeing what's going on in the space. Through pure inventive genius alone, he managed to hold up everything, including a cantilevered balcony with legs that are behind everyone. Not a single person has an obstructed view anywhere, like in this room right now. Hi. And it's like, you know, that was not supposed to happen. The, let's include everyone in one room was the goal. Is that possible? Can you see 2,000 plus people in one room with not a single pillar? But more than that, do you notice the shape? It's not the T anymore. Students say, it looks like a lamp or a Christmas tree, you know, all these various things, which it does. Um, and it's also interesting that it's on a north-south axis instead of east-west broke with that symbolism for a functional reason that I can't go into now. But more important and more interesting and more kind of curious to me is that it looks and has almost the exact shape of a bell. He mentions a bell. And in fact, the Walker Art Center with its wonderful uh, um, uh, 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 article when the Abbey Church was dedicated comes out and mentions that it was, it, it was in his thinking. But I don't, I don't know that anyone's pursued that or just even brought out some of the connotations of that. 
I'll just point out a couple. For one thing, without baptism, which the monks had insisted go back to a more prominent place at the front of the church, instead of being relegated to the side of the transom, you know, some, some place of lesser importance, they went back to the older, more ancient placement of it, at the front, and not just at the front. Without a clapper, that little metal ball, seemingly unimportant, you don't really see it even. All this is glorious, but this doesn't make any noise without that. And you don't have a body of believers, you don't have a church without baptism. It's an interesting comparison to make. Um, what else can I say? Um, this altar got pulled away from the back wall into a central location. If you caught it on the footage I showed you at the beginning, do you know that the bishop was facing the people from day one? <sighs> um, that they could do that, that the monks could be circled around the altar and function there daily, but then also include everyone in one room when it called for it, when the Eucharist was the whole community to celebrate. Oh, that is an oak cross. This is one of the other really, really interesting elements to the church. Um, this isn't that. This doesn't do that. This is an arrow. The steeples are arrows. They, you know, when, they, when you hear the bell ring and you're looking across your farm field, it's like, oh, yeah, church time. Remember God. Well, effectively, that doesn't do that at all. Um, Breuer admits that one of the interesting things he came across when traveling in Greece as a young man were these freestanding towers with a bell in them that you could see swinging and a cross on it somewhere. A freestanding tower. And could he adapt that in this case with a really bold shape that showed you the bells swinging rather than enclose them into two towers where they were, the two twin towers? You heard them, you never saw them unless you were one of the lucky monks who got to swing on them. Um, but you never saw them ring. And you know, and I know, when they're all five ringing, which has been a little while, but you know, uh, they're a stunning sight. They're beautiful to watch, even as they are to listen to. So uh, that idea of making a structure that would do that ultimately draws attention to the land as opposed to the sky. You could make all sorts of connections with the theology and the growing interest in connecting to the community of believers seeing God in the community around us and not just in some distant heaven physically, rather here among us. And that flat roof, that flat top, arguably from a design standpoint, I mean, I'm paying, this like, imagine this is a composition, this is a painting. I see the parallels. I'm looking at the land, not the sky. Just from a design standpoint, I'm looking at the land. I think it's brilliant. It's a brilliant stroke. Mind you, it's not a dull building. Once you get under that, Bell banner especially, it's pretty dynamic. And last but not least, uh, I'm trying to stay very close to the 12.30 time. The, the materials are pretty simple. He says, good Lord, you're sitting on one of the world's largest depositories of granite. We've got to use some of it somehow. Um, but clay for the floor, concrete, oak, gosh, you've got a whole forest of it. Let's use it. It's a beautiful material for furniture. Let's use it. Glass and metal. This is what I love. That concrete, I don't know if most people appreciate it or see it very often, that concrete shows you every wooden form into which it had been cast. The wood in spirit is still there. The texture of all the wood is still there in all the concrete. You can read it today. That to me is astounding. Talk about honesty of the making and revealing the process. It's everywhere in there. And especially at night when there's uplighting on the walls, it comes out even, it looks like fabric. The, the walls of the Abbey Church look like fabric to me, which is amazing. I don't need to remind you people what it's like to go into it. It's not like going into St. Peter's with big, tall, 12, 15-foot bronze doors. They're seven feet tall. They're just oak. They're very humble. Come in. This is not, you don't, you know, you don't have to be carried on a beer to get in here. I'm going to flash through these really quickly. The water has to be moving. It says this is supposed to be a symbol of life. You're going to have stagnant, scummy water. <laughs> There's the nod to the times. That's how big baptismal fonts were in 1953, 55, 59. The doors changed to copper after baptism. I don't know if you noticed that. But the, the, that's copper inside the doors that are, that are between the baptistry and the rest of the church. Very selective use of 
precious metal like silver. Those are amazing forms. I want to jump forward to one last thing here, if I actually two last things if I go really quick. Do you mind that I'm talking really fast? There's no Q&A time. I hope that's going to be OK. <laughs> you all have to get back to work. But uh, I do want to show you something that uh, is always interesting to me and my students. I think you know by now that Joseph Albers had a different design for that window. Um, color theory, anyone? Warm colors, right? Red, orange, yellow, these are warm colors on the spectrum. What we have, there's an awful lot of blue, purple, green, gray, some red, but more predominantly the cold colors of the spectrum. If you've ever gone into the Abbey Church and shivered, instead of felt warm, by the way, Breuer and Albers designed these that are up above the altar, so they do this to the wall when sunlight hits it. If you shiver, there's a reason for it from a design standpoint, because all the light spilling into the lower part of the church comes through windows that color it blue. That it's naturally a cold light versus if we had actually gone with Albers window, I, can, I don't know what exactly it would look like, but it'd be on the warmer end of the spectrum for sure. Oh, I love this. This is uh, Ham Smith, this telegram um, when the, the committee that uh, Hillary can tell you about voted in favor of that Bach window. Um, he sends this telegram, church votes Bach window, should we go to last ditch action? I don't know what that last ditch, act last ditch action is. What did they do? I have no idea. Whatever, it didn't work. We didn't end up with that, but oh well, there it is. Last but not least, it's, it's a splendid space when it's filled. Uh, it does function. 50 years later, it still functions for all sorts of occasions. A concert, graduation, daily prayer, mass. It still functions very well. It's a challenge for us with fewer monks to be heard with each other at office, but it still functions beautifully well. Music still sounds glorious in that space. It was designed for a lot of singing monks. It, chant in Anthony's group sounds splendid in there. The acoustics are perfect for Gregorian chant. Do you want to see those? So you know that the organ screen is quote unquote temporary, right? That's a red cloth that got put behind the screen right before the dedication because Breuer had imagined that there would be an enormous mosaic of Christ in glory there. Kind of a taking off from the apse in the Great Hall, he thought that there would be a, an image of Christ in glory that would be on that panel. So that you move from baptism through the death and uh, well, life and then death and passion of Christ to the risen life. So there was an axis right down the center of the church and you went in real time and historical church time from back to front. Um, so using Photoshop, Alan Reed did some of this too. Um, imagine a Chagall up there. <laughs> or a more traditional Byzantine. Do you, do you notice what I notice and what a lot of my students then notice too? This church becomes a frame for that. And that becomes a focal point. You know, at the end of the day, it maybe is a really, really awesome thing that they couldn't, Breuer, couldn't locate an artist or find an artist whose artwork would look great there. Because the simple panel of color is actually, I would argue, maybe more conducive to praying there than looking at something that would be dated in time forever. Perhaps a Rothko approach or a Diebenkorn approach. I have no idea. But perhaps even a panel of light that you could color nowadays with technology. You could color that light. Perhaps light could be the symbol of Christ and glory rather than a physical depiction, a representational depiction of Christ and glory. I don't know. I'm speaking as a representational sculptor here. I don't think that's the choice. I don't think that's the solution. But what we'll, remains to be seen. Last but not least, that wonderful model um, at, at uh, uh, this wonderful show of Breuer, which I wish we could get here, has those hexagons as clear glass. I'd love to see the bells ringing from inside the church, but unless a tornado comes and only hits out those windows and leaves everything else intact, I want to leave what we got. But anyway, in brief, a story of how we went from one to the other. Thank you for your time. Sorry to kept you a little over time. Yeah. Thank you, David, Paul. I'm ready for round two. I don't know about anyone else, but um, let's thank him. So. Okay, he's going to turn on the light so you don't fall on your way out. Um, again, the next event we or lunch and learn we have is November 18th with Father Columbus Stewart, um, and then watch for notices on our tea and talk. So, with that, get back to work.